Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this event on the 9th of July with the topic, should we revisit the patent system for pharmaceutical products? Let me start by welcoming you all to come um, to this event here, particularly at this time of the year. It's not so easy to activate, but uh, very happy to see so many faces uh, here. Um, so what we plan to do is first uh, have a tour de table with, with the panel members here, and then we hope there will be sufficient time also for your inputs to the discussion uh, here. I will be very brief because we are time constrained. We definitely are going to make the um, deadline of uh, 2.30 here because we have to catch trains uh, here, so we have all the right incentives. Um, so let me very briefly introduce why uh, we thought it would be very very good to have this topic discussed um, on a Bruegel event here. So the background of why uh, we, we're discussing this um, is on the EU agenda, of course, uh, there is lots of discussion on innovation-based growth and making sure we have the right framework conditions for that. And IP and patents is one of those framework conditions here. But there is a lot of discussion on how that IP should actually be designed. So there are arguments why um, a stronger IP is necessary for innovation-based growth before, because of the incentives it creates for R&D here. Also that it um, allows for more easy entry of specialized technology startups if they have uh, well-functioning uh, patents to protect them. But at the same time, there's also a lot of discussion that patents may actually inhibit innovation, particularly cumulative uh, innovation, that it may raise transaction costs uh, here. And of course, it, it gives market power uh, um, that can actually be extended even after the IP <coughs> protection. So the whole discussion on the patent system uh, as part of the innovation-based growth is how strong should the patent protection be, how broad and how long patent protection should actually be to manage these trade-offs. But then particularly for pharmaceutical products, uh, there is uh, also the issue of, first of all, of course, um, the, the public budget on health, uh, how that should be um, evolving. Uh, in Europe, and then, but there is also the issue of the importance of, of the health sector for Europe's global competitiveness and particularly its global innovation competitiveness. Um, if you look at the, the EU innovation expenditures by the corporate sector, which is something we, we, uh, we want to improve but feel very difficult to do so, well, the pharma sector accounts for about 30% of, of all scoreboard R&D, so it is really very important for our overall corporate um, innovativeness um, and uh, European pharma is uh, with, with Europe then still including Switzerland and the UK too <laughs> which in this case is, is really very critical um, UK pharma, European pharma uh, sorry, is, is also really important for competitiveness at the world scale uh, here so we are also at, uh, the pharma sector is really very important for overall competitiveness of Europe in innovation and then of course it's very important to see to which extent the innovative competitiveness of this sector can be maintained using uh, the, the, um, the framework conditions such as, as, as the patent system uh, here. So today we're going to focus on the patent system as one of these <coughs> elements to, to support innovativeness um, in, in pharma. Um, but of course there are other important issues that, that um, enter into this discussion as well here, such as the regulatory approvals, the pricing decisions uh, here, uh, certainly um, also access to US markets for instance is something that uh, is currently also on a big discussion. But nevertheless, today we are going to focus on, on the patent system. We have very nice people here uh, in, in the panel. I'm going to very briefly already introduce them to you so that uh, we won't take too much time uh, during the presentations. So we're going to start with Amarilis Verhoeven, um, who is the head of unit of the industrial property uh, unit at the European Commission in DG Growth. Um, it's her unit that is, that is actually responsible for the uh, analysis analysis and revisiting of the patent system for pharmaceutical products. So she will give a broad overview of where that policy question actually comes from. Then we will move to two presentations um, which will provide a bit of, of uh, study material. One is a presentation by Christian uh, Gervelund, who is a um, 
uh, senior uh, fellow at uh, Copenhagen Economics, and did a, who did a uh, study on the economic impact of uh, the patent system and the extension of, of the patent system protection. Uh, so he will focus mostly on the results of that study, which focus on the economic effects on that. Then we will have um, an intervention by Roberto Romandini, uh, who is a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute, and they did a study on the legal aspects um, of, of the patent extension. Um, and he will also pre present us the main insights from that study. Uh, once we have that material, we're going to look at the academic side. Uh, we have two uh, discussions from the academic side. One is Margaret Kyle, who is a professor of economics at the uh, Ecole des Mines, um, and she specializes uh, in uh, pharma R&D, focusing on uh, competition, patents, productivity. Uh, and then we will have uh, our own internal uh, senior fellow, uh, Bruno van Pottelsbergen, uh, whom I guess most of you know. So he's the expert on technology management and, and patents. Uh, he was a chief um, uh, economist at EPO here, so he will give second perspective uh, from the academic side. And then we will end with um, uh, the, the view from the corporate sector, which will be represented by Arno Hartmann, who represents the FPA IP expert group, but who is himself also in charge of the uh, patent portfolio at Merck, Merck uh, in Germany uh, here. So that's a very brief introduction. I hope you realize how good uh, quality people will we have here at the panel uh, here. Um, so um, with further, no further delay, I'm going to give the floor to Amarilis. Yep. Uh, many thanks, Ray Nilde, and uh, hello to everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I will myself, so I've been introduced indeed, I am working in the European Commission, and um, I will basically give an appetizer for the discussion this afternoon. You won't hear too much economic stuff from me, just because I'm not an economist. So I will basically explain uh, why it is that uh, at the level of the European Union, we have been starting to have a closer look at the pharmaceutical sectors and the IP incentives in that sector, and where we are now, basically, with the analysis. That is what you can expect from me. Um, maybe the starting point. Starting point is the start of this commission. As you know, this commission is working very thematically. And this commission came out in the very beginning of its mandate with what we call the single market strategy, which is a strategy all about making, using the single market as a lever to promote growth and innovation in Europe. And in the context of that strategy, the commission announced that it would go for a targeted recalibration of certain aspects of pharmaceutical patents and SPC protection. That is basically what it says, the single market strategy announcing three areas for which could be covered by this targeted recalibration. One, the possible introduction of a unitary SPC. Second, a possible recalibration of the so-called Bullar exemption, which allows for um, a limited production for the, for the purpose of study and analysis um, of pharmaceuticals. And then, third, the possible introduction of a waiver, to, um, of an export waiver, so as to create opportunities for generics and biosimilar industries. That was a menu of the single market strategy. It was announced in the beginning of this commission, again, with the aim to um, recalibrate a system, which already, if you hear the word recalibration, you hear that the commission is not talking about an overhaul, but a recalibration in order to make sure that the system stays fit for purpose, is still uh, the best possible system in the world that we need for Europe to support competitiveness in this area, competitiveness and innovation. Our political masters, the European Parliament and the Council have reacted to the single market strategy. Um, the EP adopted a resolution, very much welcoming the recalibration um, of the SPC system, and in particular calling for a waiver, the introduction of the waiver before the end of the mandate. That was very clear from the EP. Council, um, double reaction. In reaction to the single market strategy, the Council basically stresses the importance of the IP framework for innovation, competitiveness and job creation. Very general mandate to the Commission, please go ahead with your recalibration, but without a clear indication. But back to back to this, we got also as a Commission a mandate from the Health Council 
from the health ministers, which called for a broader review of all pharmaceutical incentives. Because, and that is something you know, um, if you're talking about um, incentives in the pharma sector, there is of course patent protection, there is SPT, SPC protection, but there is also uh, some EIP-like protection, some exclusivities which are created by other tools, by other means that belong more to the health area. And I'm sure that Christian Jeveland will explain a little bit more about that. So there we had a call to basically put our SPC review even in a larger picture to look at all pharmaceutical incentives from various angles, by the way. Not only from the focus of, uh, from the angle of innovation and competitiveness, but also looking specifically at the angle of access to medicines, affordability of medicines. And that very much also translates the current debate, political debate which we are facing in council, in parliament, but also in, in, at the international level, we are dealing with WIPO. There the debate is always, yeah, if you protect IP, that's maybe very good for innovation, but what is then the effect that it has on access to medicines, especially in poor countries, what is the effect on affordability, etc., and isn't there a way to rebalance, etc. So that reflected a little bit the more general debate that we see, not only in Europe, but worldwide. With this large menu, um, we started doing, I think, the right thing. We launched studies. Why? Because um, it is very important in this area, in all areas, but in this area also in particular, to get it right from the economic uh, perspective. So we launched a whole series of studies, and some of our contractors uh, are here actually today. Uh, both Christian Jervelund, who looked at all IP incentives in general in the meantime, but also uh, we contacted the Max Planck Institute, which has been conducting a legal analysis, and I'll leave it to them to basically give a couple of pointers of what they came up with. Um, that's not all. That's not our full evidence base. We contracted a lot of other studies. We contracted some other studies as well. One conducted by Margaret Kyle, also here on the panel, so I'm very happy to have them all explain a little bit what they've been doing. But in the meantime, we've also, of course, been looking at other studies that exist already out there. It's not only the commission who is commissioning studies. We also try to read, analyze, understand, make sense of other studies that have been made um, in, in this particular area. We did not only conduct studies. We also launched a public consultation uh, at the end of last year. And um, these are basically, and the, and the public consultation was very much targeted on the question, quo vadis with the SPC regime, the Supplementary Protection System. Results of the public consultation show a couple of things. And all, all this is, by the way, public. You can find it on our DigiGrow website. First of all, a big support for the introduction of a unitary SPC. Now, you're going to ask us, where is it now, the unitary SPC? I have to disappoint you, as long as we don't have a unitary patent, and we don't have it because of the ratification process for all kinds of reasons, and I spare you the details, it's not over yet, it is very difficult to introduce a unitary SPC, which would basically link on a system which is not yet in place. But we can say, wide support for the unitary SPC, with a lot of good suggestions in this respect, and I can tell you that from the Commission side, once we have the green light for the <coughs> unitary patent, we will not shield away from also introducing proposals in this area. Second, when it comes to the SPC system as a whole, there, the main tenor of the public consultation is that there is a need for further clarification and guidance. Why? Because people responding to, 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 the, to, the, um, to, the, to the system, I mean, a general feeling was that whilst the SPC system is fit for purpose, on this not all, of course, agree, yeah? you have voices pro and con, but in general, SPC is not too contested, I would say. But there seems to be a problem with um, uniform interpretation, with uniform application. It seems that there are quite a number of divergences across member states um, relating to the application of the SEC system. And that combined with an overall lack of transparency under which conditions our SPC has been granted, in, what, in which member states versus to what, and whatever. So this led to general calls for more guidance in this area. And um, yeah, we're still, we are still actually analyzing this, see what needs to be done. As you know, we're not going, to, uh, going, going very fast in this area. 
because um, the SPC system has been the subject of quite a number of prejudicial questions before the Court of Justice on actually very important topics. And so we've decided basically to wait and see what sense the Court of Justice is going to give out of the SPC proposal with, uh, before we actually consider further guidance or further steps in this area. On the way for the public consultation led to um, basically show that this is an area where there is a lot of controversy. Uh, not surprisingly, those rather belonging to the SPC holders, the originators, said no way, we don't want a waiver, we don't need it, forget it, leave us alone. Whereas the proponents from the generics and the biostimulus industry were, of course, saying, yes, of course, where is the waiver now? We need it. We, we, we did it yesterday, not today. Please give it to us. Same with representatives from patients, health system, rather in favor of a waiver, as you can imagine. From the member states, not a lot of replies. Member states were basically giving holding replies. Some member states basically expressing a strong interest in a waiver, but all in all, not representative enough. Um, we went for a proposal. We published a proposal at the end of May on the waiver. So that is now on the table of the Council and the European Parliament. That's not the subject of the discussion today, but I can tell you for those who want to know what is the waiver proposal. It is about a very limited exception, allowing actually manufacturers of generics biosimilars to start manufacture in Europe during the term of the SPC protection, but for the sole exclusive purpose of export outside Europe, subject also to rather important safeguards, I spare you the details, and that would become applicable for all SPCs that have already been granted. Why did the Commission introduce a waiver? And I will stop there. Um, well, because uh, after a long analysis of quite a number of stu studies and documents, we did a headcount and I think that at least nine economic studies, quite comprehensive economic studies, have been analyzed in this context. We felt that on balance, uh, this is the right thing to do in order to beef up the competitiveness of the pharmaceutical industry in Europe. Not only of one particular side of the industry, but of all the ph pharmaceutical industry. And the reason is that if you look at the market, um, the pharmaceutical market as a global, as a whole, is growing very rapidly. It is growing at a global scale, and it is growing very fast, in particular in generics and the biosimilar sector. So our feeling is that unless we give that waiver, allow companies to start manufacturing in order to be ready to compete on global markets where SPC protection is either no <coughs> longer existing or has already expired, our companies are going to be are going to be met with a competitive disadvantage and they will decide not to manufacture in Europe, they will decide to relocate outside of Europe where typically SPC protection is much lower than in Europe and once they're out they won't, they won't come back. With as a result that Europe would be left with an impoverished landscape, no longer with the full pharmaceutical ecosystem that we've been building up and of which we should, in, I believe, be very proud. So we did calculations of the economic benefits. I don't, I don't give you the details on that, but all in all, uh, we saw that if we really as Europe want to reap the benefits of competitiveness, this waiver is the thing to do. So that is not on the table, but again, this is a small proposal as part of a wider review which is still ongoing, and um, I will stop it here uh, because the rest of the discussion should go into all the economics and should inspire us for taking next steps. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Amarilis, and I think your intervention already made it clear how difficult it is to really clearly identify the, the issue here, and it's very, very easily uh, is extended in terms of importance to a lot of other issues uh, here. So I'm sure the discussion will, uh, will pick that up. Uh, Christian, can I leave the floor for you? Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation and uh, good to see so many people here. My name is uh, Christian Jarlund. I'm a partner with the uh, economics consultancy Copenhagen Economics, um, Nordic based and uh, with a global outreach. Um, we have an office here in Brussels as well. So it's good to be here. Um, I headed the 
Copenhagen Economic Study that I'm about to present to you uh, in a minute. First, let me tell you these, uh, you know, whatever I'm presenting here today, and for the remainder of the discussion, whatever comes out of my mouth, it's uh, on my sort of opinions and, and, and mine alone, uh, not reflecting the Commission necessarily. And, and also keep in mind that this is uh, one, one source of information out of uh, several for policy making. Uh, once that is set, I'm going to, uh, looking very much forward to spend around 10 minutes presenting, take you through it. Um, I did not expect everyone to read the entire report, although I was told, and it's the first time I've been told that when I came, that my, st my study was the short one, because luckily I'm in, I'm in company with Max Planck, and then all of a sudden this becomes the pixie <laughs> version. And uh, of course, that's the first time I hear that. But uh, still, I'll spend some time, take you through it. Okay, so basically what we looked at um, in, say, around the, when, we, when we go through the report and talk about the five, the incentives and the rewards, we're talking about the base of the patents lasting for 20 years. That's, that's nothing specific for the pharmaceutical industries like that everywhere, right? Uh, but on top of that comes a number of incentives and rewards, the SPC, data protection, market protection, pediatric, um, investigations and, and market exclusivity for orphans. So those are the ones that we're looking at when we talk about the incentives and the rewards throughout the study. Um, basically how it works, um, try and see here that sort of you have uh, the, the, the number of years from a patent is taking on say a molecule down on the x-axis and you have the combined protection because the point is the patents and these five incentives of rewards, they work in combination with each other. So how it works is that you're granted that 20 years of protection from a patent, from your first sort of patented molecule. Let's take that as an example. And then it takes time from that molecule was identified and patented until it actually turns into a saleable marketed pharmaceutical product or medicinal product. So of course time goes, that's where we see this drop, you know, every year you, you have one year less of protection. And, um, and then the SPC kicks in, so it says after five years we're going to give you some uh, um, compensation, so to speak. So we know it takes a long time uh, to develop from the patented molecule uh, and to actually turn it into a product. So from year five we're going to give you some compensation there and the SPC sort of year by year compensates you uh, as, a, as a pharmaceutical um, innovator company. We're not going to keep doing that though, you know, you also need to uh, be able to finish your, finish your research and come up with a product. So after uh, you see that the line goes down after 10 years it starts going down, so now you're, 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 you're simply just losing years again. But then uh, eventually we say, okay, you, you can never, you know, because you could eventually go down to one year, zero years, right? If it took you 20 years to, or more than that, to, to come up with a product. Uh, but after a number of years, say, okay, we're going to sort of put a, a limit of, of 10 years and, and, and have that below. So you never experience less than 10 years. That's the market protection dimension. So that's basically trying to give an, a graphical illustration of how the patents and the incentives and rewards work together. So you start, we started building that into a, a, a measure of effective protection, right? Because you can imagine, you can take for, for 558 products that we identified, you can go and find the molecule, you can find what kind of, you know, was there an SPC applied for, did the product or did the molecule and product get the SPC and so forth, in which countries. And then you can start trying actually to build some kind of understanding, a, a unified measure called effective protection that really sort of tries to, to basically just describe how these things work in combination with each other. So uh, when we did that, that's even before going into any kind of advanced statistical analysis, you get some interesting uh, results out of that. So looking here, what you see here is the effect of the SPC. So what you're seeing here is, is, is kind of the, the added number of years that the SPC um, provides for, these, for this here 558 medicinal products that we looked at, 45% of which had 
an SPC in at least uh, one country. And we looked and saying, okay, uh, for, the, for, the, for the products here where the SPC is the last one to expire, you can, easily see, you can easily see a lot of situations where an SPC would not be the last one to expire, right? So for instance, if a uh, pharmaceutical product, medicinal product came out very shortly after the patent, original patent was taken, the SPC would not apply. Or if it took a long time, the SPC would not apply. But, um, but you have here a, a, an estimate saying for the, for, the, for the medicinal products where the SPC is the last pr measure of protection to expire, it adds on average 2.6 years to the effective protection period. So that's one kind of, a, uh, one kind of a analysis or one kind of result. You can do that, and we did that. Uh, please go and, and, and see it in the report. You can do that for the other measures of protection. Let me show you one more for data and market protection. And, and you can sort of see that as well. So looking for the, for the past sort of uh, 10 to 16, you say and see an average adding you know, 4.8 years So saying, uh, if we, you know, for the ones, for the products where um, market protection, data protection was the last measure of protection to expire, for those where it actually was binding, so to say, it added on average 4.8 years uh, looking at the period 10 to 16. So that's the first kind of results, and that's really just trying to utilize and, and understand the implications and what kind of insight lies in looking at that effective protection measure and looking also at you know, how the marginal propensities or how the marginal properties of each of these measures sort of work. We then try to put this measure into a statistical model, try to, to tease out the implications for innovation and for availability, meaning launch in different countries, and, and finally for price, the effect of price. Um, and basically, what we came out with here that in a given, say, European country, where you have you know taken out an SPC, it, it drives very little uh, sort of in terms of your as a company decision to invest in R&D if it's a particular you know, country where your R&D is located gets better protection that drives very little. Um, looking at it, that might not surprise so much. Uh, what we did get, the big effect was the SPC really drives and the other protection measures, sorry, the other, the, the, the general sort of protection measures, they drive innovation in terms of, of R&D spending, uh, modeled by R&D spending, when the countries that the companies sort of sell their products to where their market share is highest and so forth, when, when protection is increased there, when, when you experience higher effective protection in your most important markets. We sort of speculate that that's probably why the domestic protection, I mean, in the country where you do your R&D and stuff, that is really less important for many countries or for, many, for most companies. It's a global market. And the exact kind of market and demand and the protection regime in the country where they are located uh, would often matter less in a sort of global uh, global market, you know, uh, potential and demand setting. Also, we find that uh, as as countries where you sell your market your products grow richer, uh, that increases or spurs uh, R and D spending. So we interpret that as as countries getting wealthier, they also choose to spend a larger share of their wealth and more money on on uh, healthcare services, and including also pharmaceutical or medicinal products. One minute, really, is that it? So, um, looking at availability, we find a quite large dispersion. It's a difficult graph. Let me take you through the left one. The right one is just same, just uh, with different uh, cutoff. So we're trying to take all the 558 products that we have and say, okay, find out when they were launched the first time somewhere in the world, right? When was this product launched the first time? And then let's see all these products. When were 25% of them? How fast were 25% of these products? The 558, when were they launched in different EU countries? And we see in Sweden, it's within a year. So if a product is launched, 
you know, the products launch somewhere in the world, uh, within you know, less than a year, 25% will, will be launched in Sweden. And you see how that increases as an average of 1.6 years, and you see some countries like Romania, Hungary, um, Hungary uh, the, the launch time, it takes a long time for, uh, for products to get launched. Then when you see the 50%, when is 50% when is launched? And there you see some countries they don't even they don't even go up there with a graph. That means that they don't ever receive they don't ever experience the launch of fifty percent um, of, of of the products. Finally, we try to look at price. This is very difficult, as you know. Price information is very scarce, um, but we tried to isolate some products where we felt that we could look at the impact of having uh, effective protection you know, when it ended and when we had uh, generics on the market. And we, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of, of in line with other findings, uh, this is a graph from the, uh, the, um, the sector inquiry by the commission back in nine, the little uh, pop-up window I just came on. So it, 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 it shows that there is some kind of reduction in price until time zero when, when, when loss of when exclusivity is, is, is out. Or it closes, you see there's sort of a some kind of adjustment of prices before that down to the year zero, and then you see sort of a, a generic coming in at a at an average quite lower price. It doesn't seem to have the big effect though on, on the uh, innovator product that has now lost exclusivity in the first sort of quarters, but uh, um, but you see a, a quite big difference in the beginning. Yeah, yeah that was it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So already this shows also not just the impact on innovation, but also on other things like uh, accessibility and uh, pricing, which I'm sure will also come back. So I now give the floor to, uh, to you for the legal aspects. Seven minutes. <laughs> Sorry to have to be so strict. But... Today, at uh, this uh, conference, I'm a member of the academic staff of the Max Planck Institute, that is also an academic institution, uh, we are not consultant, and I coordinated uh, the study of uh, the Max Planck on the legal aspect of SPC. The study has a purely legal character, it focuses on a number of topics uh, that I just list in these slides. Uh, our legal analysis was supplemented by a fact-finding process of, with a number of activities, including an extensive uh, consultation of the stakeholders, uh, seminar and meeting with the National Patent Office. Today, I intended uh, to comment on some findings. Uh, I cannot, of course, uh, sum up all the recommendations of the study. Uh, these three points were an assessment of uh, the case law of the Court of Justice, uh, some comments on the question uh, posed by the Commission whether or not the SPC regime should be extended to other technical fields or other category of products, and the last point, the unitary SPC. Uh, for reason of time, I will limit myself uh, to the first point, uh, general assessment of the impact of the case law of the Court of Justice. Now, in order to understand this impact, uh, it's important to recall uh, the purposes of the SPC legislation when it was introduced in 1992, as intended by the European Commission with the proposal of 1990. Because in this field of legislation, the theological approach, the theological interpretation of the law has played a very important role in developing the law. Now, what were these purposes? As typical for uh, legal EU Act, it was a number of purposes. The first one was preserving uh, the integrity of the common market, because at that time uh, two countries started uh, to adopt domestic legislation for extending uh, the term of patent granted for pharmaceutical product, France and Italy. The second purpose was fostering pharmaceutical research, and we will see what type of pharmaceutical research the Commission with the proposal intended to foster putting the European industry on an equal footing with the US and Japanese industry because 
both country provided the time for extension of some category of patents, preventing a relocation of research centers for Europe to jurisdiction with a longer term of protection, and establishing a simple and transparent system. But why this purpose was so important uh, for the Commission? Because the legislation charged the National Patent Office with the task of granting a certificate, and some of these patent office were purely registration office without a technical staff that could conduct a sophisticated examination. I want to point this point out this aspect because in a unitary SPC office or unitary SPC division, maybe this need to have a simple system uh, is not so urgent as at that time. What is important is to understand what type of pharmaceutical research the SPC regime intended to foster. Now, the starting point in the consideration of the Commission explanatory memorandum was the statement the finding that a decline in the development of new active substances in Europe could be observed. New active ingredient of medicinal product. In the same time, it could be observed an erosion of the patent term for new active substances. There were some studies submitted by FPA in the memorandum, this document mentioned by the explanatory memorandum. There were other studies considered at that time, the study of SUSHI that was published by the Journal of My Institute, according to which the patent term for uh, new active substance uh, was reduced to nine years, nine and a half years. The conclusion of the Commission was therefore that uh, a supplementary protection, a longer term of patent protection for new medicinal product, that is medicine product including new active ingredient, was needed in Europe in order to make research, pharmaceutical research in this field profitable. This purpose, this background, was very clearly translated in the proposal of the Commission and enacted the legislation. Two fundamental principles need to be recalled in this context. The principle that only one certificate per product intended as a TV ingredient should be possible, Article 3C, and the principle that the grant of certificate should be based on the first marketing authorization covering the debt active substance. The consequence of this legislation, the Commission mentioned that uh, all, all the active ingredients never authorized before should be eligible for a certificate and mentioned the number of 50, a number that is more eloquent than any other possible argumentative argument because at that time was the average number of active substances authorized in Europe. The consequence of this legislative choice was that a new indication, new formulation of active ingredients shall not be eligible for a certificate. In essence, that was the USA American model, where only new chemical entities can be the subject of patent extension, with two differences or ambiguities. The first one was combination including all active ingredients, because, because of the definition of product in Article 1B, combination including all active ingredients could be eligible in Europe in principle for a certificate by a literal interpretation. And second, the question of the intended beneficiary of the reward. In the United States, it's clear that only the patentee that has invested directly or indirectly for an agent in developing a marketable product and obtaining the product approval can obtain the patent extension. In Europe, there was an ambiguity. It was not clear whether the legislation was directed to foster investment to develop the invention as such, or was directed to foster investment to obtain a marketable product and marketing authorization. If the latter choice is made, as in Japan and the United States, not any patentee is entitled to the SPC, but only the patentee that has contributed directly or indirectly to obtaining the marketing authorization. With the language of the Federal Circuit, the intended beneficiary would be only the patentee that is at the same time holder of the marketing authorization who has a relationship with the holder of the marketing authorization, the SL famous decision. In this context, there was an ambiguity in the legislation for the simple reason that, that the old legislation based on the assumption that marketing authorization and patent are in the same hands. One minute. Now, I try to close. The, the, the impact of the case law was really significant because today, because of the theological approach of the Court of Justice, multiple SPC for the same product are possible. That was the, result, the combined result of Biogen and AP. 
even if the CPC application are not co-pending. Second, SPC for all the active ingredient, at least with respect to new indication, become possible. Consequence of NEURIM, a decision that we have radically criticized in Chapter 12 of our chapter. Finally, third party MASPC, the CSPC based on the marketing authorization of related identity according to the practice of the National Patent Office are admitted without any qualification. And this is an interpretation of Baugen that I agree with. There is a obiter dictum in Eli Lilly that could allow a different conclusion, but it's only an obiter dictum. Another issue with the case law is not only the transformation and the liberalization of the granting process in favor of the patentee. Another issue is also the absence of clarity. Uh, one of the central provisions of the legislation, Article 3A, according to which the product must be protected by the patent in order to be eligible for a certificate, it was read by the Court of Justice as meaning that the product must be specified in the wording of the claims. The, Court of Justice drew a distinction between specifying the wording of the claims and not specifying the wording of the claims that has no basis in the law applicable to the basic patent, but despite that, ask the court and the patent office to draw this distinction by referring to Article 69 and corresponding provision of the National Patent Act. So such distinction, in our view, is not clear. And the fact that during the study there were two other referrals asking the same question is an indirect evidence for this assumption. But the overwhelming majority of the stem system users are of the opinion that this case law does not lead to practical problems in the most of the cases. Now, I uh, conclude with our some of the recommendations of the Max Planck. The first one is very obvious. When the distance between the choice made by the democratic representative of the people and the choice made by the court is so significant, the lawmaker must close this gap. And there's three options, to codify the case law or to correct it, because it's not based on primary union law. Therefore, there are no principles banding the lawmaker that would prevent the lawmaker from correcting the case law. The second recommendation is to clarify Article 3A. The third is to define the beneficiary of the legislation, any patentee only, the patentee that has invested to develop a marketable product. And finally, clarify to what extent the combination should be eligible for a certificate, because a part of the case law is originated by sequential combination, including active ingredients that were already subject of a certificate. Now, I conclude with only a remark. We found also, as uh, Ms. Ms. Verhoeven uh, has pointed out in our consultation, a strong support for unitary SPC and a strong support for guidelines. I'm not convinced that guidelines uh, can clarify all uh, the issue of the case law for the simple reason that they are not binding on courts and they postulate a common understanding of the case law of the Court of Justice that at the moment is not existing. As the unitary patent is concerned, from a technical point of view, it would be possible to create a unitary SPC based on classic European patents. We found a strong need for a unitary SPC, a unitary granting procedure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It was very helpful uh, insights uh, here. Let me try to summarize in, in one uh, minute. I think despite all the eligibility constraints, the SPC is being used, uh, at least by 45% of the, the cases here. And the impact uh, is, is as expected. It seems to be positive for innovation, but uh, negative has costs in terms of accessibility and pricing. Uh, and in any case, a legal issue should be addressed, uh, particularly the fragmentation with unitary SPC, but also the uncertainty in terms of applications where there is lots of fragmentation that needs to be cleared. So that in a nutshell, now it's time to turn to uh, some um, uh, few academic views on uh, how they actually see the need for uh, SPC and the effects of, of the patent protection extension for pharma. I turn first to Margaret. Okay, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to start with sort of a big picture approach since the title of this meeting is should we re revisit the patent system for pharmaceutical products. It, the title is much broader than the focus just on SPCs. So the patent system, we all know, has a number of important shortcomings. Uh, so some of these are just generic and some of these maybe are specific to Europe. So what is, what is a general trade-off uh, or a general issue? We need to uh, balance 
dynamic incentives with static losses. So do we have that balance correct? That's a challenge that every country faces. Uh, and these are now linked in the sense that this is a global market. So what the US does or what Europe does should probably be uh, considered in light of what India and China do as well. Okay, it's a global market. Uh, another important shortcoming of the patent system is that patents are one size fits all. We give a 20 year term regardless of how innovative uh, the invention is, regardless of its, of its underlying market value or in the case of pharmaceuticals, therapeutic value. And a lot of that is because we just don't know what the market value or the therapeutic value is at the time the patent application is filed. Right? We're just dealing with a, a lack of information. But that can be a problem if you don't think that the market, when, when a drug finally reaches the market, if the market is not somehow lining up uh, market rewards uh, and social value, then we're going to get distortions. Uh, and so I think that's something we should, we should probably worry about. Uh, another shortcoming of the patent system is that uh, there can be distortions in R&D created by the fact that patent terms of, are of fixed length. So all else equal, a company is probably going to prefer to invest in a project that yields clinical results after two years versus one that yields results after 18 years. And so for some cancers, you have to wait a long time to see the effect of a drug if you're looking at mortality. For some infections, maybe it's much quicker. And so that could cre create some distortions uh, just because uh, there's a fixed term of protection uh, starting from the date of patent application. Then things that are, I think, specific to Europe is the, the, the fact that there's a fragmented system of, of intellectual property, which we've been talking about addressing for some time now. There's also uh, work on fixing the system of regulatory approvals, and I think the EMA has done a huge uh, amount, uh, has reflects a huge amount of progress along those, uh, along those lines, but we still have a system of legacy approvals in place where there's a regulator in each country and most generic drugs, because they're on old products that were approved before the creation of the European Medicines Agency, still face country-specific regulatory costs. Uh, and that, that's a European uh, bug uh, that we haven't quite uh, fixed completely. Um, so what does the SPC do in, in this context? So it might rebalance these dynamic and static effects uh, because it adds to, uh, in principle, it adds to the period of dynamic uh, benefits. It also adds to the period of static losses. So we have to, again, wonder, do we have that balance correct? Uh, it might address some of the distortions associated with fixed patent terms, although probably less than another tool like data exclusivity, which starts at the period when a product reaches the market rather than um, the period before development is finished. Um, it might, I mean, I know, I know this was a goal to relocate or revitalize European, uh, the European industry. It's not clear to me why people would believe that that would have a strong effect on the location of research. Uh, I think that's something that, uh, that's a common mistake that policymakers buy into. If, we, if you want to promote pharmaceutical research in Europe, I think there are probably other more obvious levers to be, to be moving there. Uh, so in other words, I think that the SPC doesn't fix a lot of the well-known problems that we see in the patent system. So maybe we should be focusing on other things that we can fix. And I think there are things that we can fix without messing with the IP system because that really is opening a Pandora's box. It took so much effort to get the world on board with the idea of a 20-year term that was implemented under the TRIPS agreement in 1995. Do we really want to go back and revisit that, especially in light of current political uh, leanings. I'm not sure that anybody really wants to touch that. So what could we do in Europe to make the system work a little bit better given the, the intellectual property system we have? I think the EU could do a lot more about reducing entry lags. So the EMA is a huge uh, benefit there, but, uh, but there could be other changes as well. So one issue is that throughout, we've always been talking about uh, the period when marketing authorization is given which is not necessarily the same as when a product reaches the market because there's a period of pricing and reimbursement negotiations that can take a long time and that is country by country. That still, uh, that still represents a big friction in getting drugs to market. So what could we do there? Well, we could maybe coordinate on health technology assessments so that we don't have different clinical trials requested by each different HTA. Maybe we could start that process before the marketing authorization is granted so that we don't have this additional wait after a product reaches the market. Uh, I think um, 
you know, that should be a win-win, both for patients and for, for industry. That seems like something we should really, we, we, we could push on. I think the EU could also do more to promote generic competition. So those are, there are valid concerns that, you know, we, we give all this intellectual property and maybe we don't have this balance of dynamic and static uh, effects quite correct. Some of that I think is not due to the patent system, it's due to other frictions in getting generic drugs to market. And I think the EU could do more, uh, it, specific countries could do more to promote generic competition. And that's, uh, that would solve a lot of the access and affordability issues or address some of the access and affordability issues without having to mess with, uh, with the patent system. Um, and the last point I want to leave with is I think we should think about what the consequences of any change to the IP system might be. So specifically, how would other countries react? So it's possible that if Europe decided, okay, we really, really think it's important to provide a minimum of 10 years or 15 years or whatever it is, that Europe could then use that as an example for negotiating with other countries and trade agreements and pushing other countries to provide the same kind of intellectual property protections. It, Maybe. It's also quite possible that other countries would say, isn't it great that Europe is willing to pay monopoly prices for 15 years? That is allowing firms to earn back their investments. I therefore don't need to grant, the, I don't need to provide 15 years of protection, or I don't need to give high prices because the incentives have already been created in Europe. That is the argument and that the complaint that many companies have about, the, or that many Americans have about the US system, that it's driving innovation for the world because the Americans are paying high prices that everybody else can free ride on. So I think you might wanna, we might wanna think about what, what kind of knock-on reactions would there be in the policies of other markets if we started changing those in Europe. Uh, and let me just end there and give other people a chance. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, it was a very, uh, very useful intervention. You brought in more instruments to the table than just looking at the patent uh, instrument uh, here, uh, also emphasizing the need to, to look at the uh, market introduction, market, um, and also generic competition and competition policy instruments uh, here. And I think it's really very important to extend the set of instruments here. And then also bringing in this global perspective of uh, how we're doing this with negotiation particularly with the US market. Bruno? Yes, thank you very much. Minutes. I broadly agree with what was uh, just said uh, by you, so uh, I'll try to complement, uh, which is uh, a bit more difficult. And I'd like also to insist on the fact that we have to look for the pharmaceutical industry at the ecosystem in Europe. I mean, if a patent system works well, it's far to be the determinant of innovation performance. It's related to many other issues. And this ecosystem, uh, you have universities, you have regulatory, regulatory constraints and the pricing policy, and I'll get back to that by trying to, to bring uh, new ideas. Um, but first, the key question was, do we need uh, SPC in Europe, yes or no? And uh, of course, to reply to that question, ideally, we should, know, we should know what's the cost of innovating in companies, we should know the profitability, and then assess whether uh, it's positive or negative, and then, and then draw a, a patent policy, but this is not possible, and so we have this 20 years. And uh, I have the feeling that we should be fair to all industries, so even the pharmaceutical, uh, they should have 20 years of uh, protection. And uh, if they need uh, a longer time uh, to develop their innovation and go to the market, it's logical to have uh, an SPC. It's a, it's a little bit with what happens with the pension scheme of the professors in Belgium. <laughs> we need more time to be appointed, so we need, it's exactly the same debate. But um, let, let me go back to the, uh, I'm professor, so I'd like to, <laughs> to bring a message. Um, so, uh, the, the point is, yes, okay, we need an, uh, an SPC, but the, the key question is how do we deliver it? And uh, the next question, I would say, once you decide to do it, how do you do it? And there are two issues. There are the rules and the governance of it. And I've seen in the European Commission uh, survey that uh, there were questions about the rules and the governance. So it's clear that about the rules, uh, we, we have, I, I like what the US does. Huh? It's, not, it's for the first use of a drug, not the secondary use of a drug. And we, have an in, we need an institution that monitors that. 
um, the formula between the difference, the time difference between patent filing and the entry into the market, definitely agree. Uh, but then uh, for which type of drug it needs to be assessed. And so it, it goes to the governance question. And I've seen that there were two options, one in Europe and one at the European Patent Office. And here I, I will be, would be very clear, not at the European Patent Office. Because Europe lacks an industrial policy. The EPO is not working for the European Union. It's working for 38 member states. It's fully independent. And that's the weakness of the European industrial policy. So if we need to get further towards the, the single market, or more single market, because we are very far from it at the moment, if we want to get closer to the single market, that institution should rather be within the European Union and probably close to the EMEA, because the EMEA delivers the authorization, so they are the best place to assess uh, whether a patent, uh, an SPC should be delivered. Of course, in collaboration with the EPO, but not by the EPO. Um, the second point I'd like uh, to bring, still related to the broader perspective, when I saw the question, should we revisit the patent system for pharmaceutical companies, I mean, le let's first fix the patent system as such. We still don't have a unitary patent system. It's still not there. And even when we'll have a unitary patent, we are far from having a European patent system. Why? Because you still have national patent offices that grant patents autonomously, independently from the European Patent Office. So you believe you have a patent protection at the European level and a small national patent office is entitled to deliver intellectual property rights for 20 years without the, content, the consent of any other institution. It's completely illogical and this is what we need to solve before, I would say, uh, getting further into the, the design of the unitary patent system. I know that I might be dreaming, but we have to be realistic uh, about that. Then uh, looking at the, the rest of the ecosystem, and that's where Europe can play uh, a role. Um, ah, I forgot to say with the unitary patent, it's, I mean, Brexit. The UK is part of the unitary patent. I mean, it's the first time we have a chance to have an industrial policy tool that would be controlled by Europe. So Brexit, the UK should get out of the unitary patent. Or simply we go to our analogical approach to industrial policy. As a reminder, we quoted the US Patent Office, Japan, China. These patent offices are the industrial arm policy tool. It's an in part of the industrial policy tool. They are appointed by the Ministry of Industry or Science and Technology. They are very closely associated to it. In Europe, it's completely independent. Okay? So um, about the rest of the ecosystem, because we really talk about the competitiveness of the pharmaceutical industry, just a few remarks, because I'm, uh, I'm just here to comment. Um, agree on pricing, but then countries should collaborate. Why do you have a national pricing policy? They should get together, cluster together, have more power, and to have a more European approach to it. Second, universities, given their role, I like the, the, the European Universities Project, but we are still far from a European policy towards that. And ERC is great. We, are, we have always been very good in research. But help universities protect their invention. And at the moment, the European patent system is so complex and, ex and, and expensive, and I know what I'm talking about, that you don't help universities at the basic of the research, huh? because most of these innovations originate from universities most of the time. Help universities to protect them and get part of the royalties so that you, you, uh, you create a positive engine and, uh, of innovation. Okay, and I stop here. I have other comments, but I'll keep them for discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and uh, it was not so unexpected that you would talk with so much passion about the <laughs> unitary patent here, but all the issues you mentioned, of course, also apply in this case. Uh, so thanks for that. So the last word is for uh, Arno Hartmann, who uh, will represent uh, the FPA and the, the corporate sector. It's all about you. <laughs> so let's give the word now to you to see how you... Uh, 
That's your perspective. Okay. F first of all, thank you for the invitation. And as uh, Raniel said already, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of FPR, despite I'm uh, working for a company, namely Merck, not uh, based in Germany, the headquarters in Germany. And uh, I think I can reflect on the discussions we had on the FPR level very largely. Of course, it will not be 100% uh, 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 the opinion of all member companies, but it will be very, very close to them. And first of all, uh, the title of today was slightly changed by you, saying, should we revisit the patent system for pharmaceutical companies? This was <laughs> very nice. And it sounds even more po uh, positive than uh, pharmaceutical products. Uh, but uh, the answer is already given, I think. So uh, we, we are discussing this, what to change and how to change it. So it's not a yes or a no. It's, it has started already. And so we are very glad that after the studies uh, were performed by the Max Planck Institute, also by Copenhagen Economics, that finally on May 28th, uh, the reports came out, despite the level of discussion has shifted a little bit. When we started, or when we became first aware in 2015, I think it was, that there should be a revisit of the incentive system for the pharmaceutical industry, having many more elements than the SPC, the SPC manufacturing exemption, uh, also pediatric uh, and orphan uh, status and things like this. Um, so it boiled down towards end of last year that we go more and more to the SPC manufacturing waiver and see whether it's adequate to introduce it or not to introduce it. And um, the studies, both reports, all together are more than 1,000 pages, of course, difficult to lead. But uh, I have to say these study reports and the studies were conducted very professional and also the reports are professionally written. And, uh, we are happy that we find a lot of elements and a lot of points that our industry, namely the research-based industry, um, has discussed over the last years that they were confirmed in these studies. And uh, some of the, the points that were confirmed are, of course, uh, the SPC regulation fulfills its purpose. Yeah? Also, when uh, the, the Commission made uh, the submission to the Parliament and the Council, they say the SPC term of five years will stay untouched. And overall, we all believe that the SPC system that has developed over more than 25 years, that this is working very well. We have, of course, a few decisions that have to be fixed with, with, with case law. And, um, but uh, in, in general, I think this, this healthcare incentive uh, system and among those SPC regulation uh, is functioning very well. And uh, we also have to consider what uh, Margaret Kyle said, that uh, the patent and, and the whole discussion is a global discussion. And if we do now changes in, in our systems, this might send out a, a wrong signal to the rest of the world. We have, for example, Canada introduced an SPC recently. Um, China is going to introduce one, and uh, they are very much in line, and they are looking at our system. Our system is more or less a template. And if we do harm to this system, to the, to the incentive system in general, and especially to the patent and the SPC system, this may send out the wrong signal and may uh, uh, turn the clock back so that we lose what we have, have achieved uh, with a well-functioning system over the, over the years. Um, so it is uh, also important to know, if you look at these studies, uh, from uh, Max Planck and uh, Copenhagen Economics. Um, as I said, they have many elements that are very helpful, and I hope that uh, there will be a lot of publication around those and uh, a lot of discussion. But it's also very important to consider always the whole context and not to take single statements uh, out of it. So overall, the decision by the European Commission to submit now a proposal for the introduction of, a, uh, of an export waiver uh, of course, this was never our preference. We could have lived without such a waiver. But now, where it is submitted and the way it is proposed, I think this export waiver, uh, as the proposal says, and with the safeguards, of course, these had to have to be proper safeguards, and we have to work a little bit, uh, all have to work a little bit on those. But this seems to be uh, uh, more or less acceptable, I think. So it is, it is also very important um, with, with, these, with these studies um, to focus that uh, 
that they will be a guidance over the next years. They will be part of this, of this discussion. And, uh, and it's also important to make the point that it is uh, of utmost importance to have, if the unitary patent system should be successful, that we need to have a unitary SPC. This is, is mandatory to make it work, because the healthcare industry uh, has, uh, among all industries, I think, by far the, the largest uh, country lists. And uh, if the, the unitary patent system is, is not uh, complete, that means if the, the SPC, the unitary SPC is not added to this system, there will be some, some legal uncertainty, and this may uh, cause uh, uh, less success for the system because many pharmaceutical com companies will opt out and will not use the system because, as long as there are legal, legal uncertainties. Yeah? And um, finally, um, I, wanna, I, want, I want to say that uh, we hope that uh, once the, the manufacturing waiver uh, in, is, in the version as it's proposed now, if this is introdu introduced, that there are the right safeguards and that this may protect the, uh, uh, our industry because we are still afraid of launches at risk and the misuse of, uh, of this waiver system. Therefore, it should be limited to export, not allowing stockpiling, and, uh, and it, uh, it should have proper safeguards like the labeling and all those things that were... Uh, discussed. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. So we managed to come up with a lot of different views and uh, very uh, important insights into the discussion and this all within one hour. So great. Um, I think it's given that we only have half an hour left. I think we leave the floor now immediately to questions and answers uh, from the floor. And of course, panel members can also ask questions uh, to each other too. Um, if you are going to address a question, please introduce yourself. Try to be short uh, in your questions and always use the mic because there are people following us uh, on web stream uh, here. So who wants to start with a question? Yeah. All right, thank you. My name is Dimitri Anikel from Metzal Sans Frontier, Dr. Sweda Borders, working on access to medicines. Um, I have two remarks and I have two questions, actually, if I can take just a few minutes. Um, so with regards to the question, should we revisit the patent system for pharmaceutical products? First of all, a patent is obviously an incentive. We need incentives and rewards for innovation, but it's one type of incentives. There are other ones, grants, funding uh, of R&D, which is already taking place on top of the five incentives which have been, been presented today. And we need to take that into account that the other incentives all also have their benefits. Um, now, of course, patents have to be seen in, with regards to affordability. Uh, we have witnessed in this regard that high prices related to monopoly power under patent protection and prolonged patent protection also raises concerns with regards to uh, affordability. The HIV crisis in Africa, the dropping vaccination rates in middle-income countries due to high prices of vaccines and the rationing of hepatitis C treatments here in Europe. So let's take that into account when we're talking about rewarding innovation. What's the societal cost of these, these type of uh, in, in incentives? And that innovation also should be rewarded when it's real innovation. Um, so the quality of the patent, the patentability criteria is really an important element to take into account. And my organization has, for, in this regard, filed a patent opposition on sofosbuvir, hepatitis C treatment, because it's, we consider it old science and we don't think it's particularly strong enough. Uh, so the patentability criteria are an important element. Now with regards to my questions, I, it's re related to the SPC. Um, what I wanted to uh, address is uh, there's an assumption indeed that longer exclusivity leads to more innovation. That's also presented, if I remember well, in the Copenhagen economics uh, study. But we wonder where the data is to back this up, because it's not so clear in our, in our analysis from the report where do you find this data that really longer um, exclusivity leads to more innovation, because other research has actually contradicted this, this position. 
Um, and a second point I wanted to uh, address with what Mr. Romandini also mentioned, that um, we should provide a fair chance to recoup R&D investment, which is also one of the, the, the arguments in favor of SPC when it was introduced in 1992. So in this regard, I think we should really, we're talking about effective protection periods, so we're talking about time, but what about cost indeed? It was mentioned before, shouldn't we look at the investment, the R&D investment, and how much was invested? What was the revenue that was gained? And look at that rather than at price. Uh, so that we can really have a clear view on how much is being uh, recouped in terms of R&D investments and what the profitability is, how much is being spent on marketing and branding, uh, etc., in comparison to other elements. Thank you. Let's we take some more questions, unless there are none. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, first of all, for organizing this very, very interesting event, uh, I'm uh, Andrea Pucci, I represent Medicines for Europe. So, we are the generic and biosimilar association here in Europe. Uh, in particular, I would like to thank the Commission for taking part to this event. Uh, I would like to thank the Commission also for being brave and uh, launched this, uh, this proposal on the SPC export exemption manufacturing waiver. I don't know how to call it anymore. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd like just to, to uh, just a short remark and then uh, uh, a question also to, to the Commission. So uh, it was said also that the, the SPC, of course, is important. We, we, are, we, are, we are aware that incentives are fundamental and we are aware that the SPC per se is important for, for innovation. Uh, I w I'm wondering, because now we are mentioning that uh, China is about to introduce the SPC, that uh, Canada introduced the SPC through the CETA, uh, I'd like just to uh, remark the fact that uh, Canada at the same time introduced an export exemption uh, with the introduction of the SPC, and uh, according to the Canadian system, they have the possibility to stockpile it through the Bowler exemption. Uh, so it's a kind of different situation uh, uh, compared to what we have here in Europe. Uh, and we all know that China, their, their system uh, push the R&D uh, because there are investments that are linked uh, to Chinese uh, uh, industries. So it's, I, I, I would like to say also that this, uh, in, also in China it's a different system than in Europe, but this is not the point of my remark. I'm just wondering whether uh, there would be a possibility to think about this export exemption also because the safeguards that we do have and in the in the proposal uh, we are aware that uh, the originator side of the industry is freaking out that uh, we are going to enter the market before but it, the possibility is also now I mean we can enter that there is a risk also today according to studies of the of the Commission itself uh, the average is that eight out of 28 member states do not have an SPC on a single molecule each time. So there is a, also today there's a risk of starting a production in a member state and then to export to another member state. And we know that this is uh, happening really rarely. Uh, my question is then uh, referred to the, uh, to the fact that uh, from a political point of view, I agree that uh, it's really, really a sensitive topic and might be not the moment to, to do this uh, incentives review. So what I would like to hear from the floor, what do you think about having just this, because we do have now the possibility to have this SPC export exemption, whether you are satisfied with this kind of proposal or you would like to see anything different. Thanks. Anything different, more? Matthias. Thank you. So, Matthias Watripon, um, I co direct the uh, Institute for Interdisciplinary Innovation in Healthcare at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. And um, I must admit, um, I had a lot of the same uh, reaction as Margaret and, and Bruno. Uh, at some level, even though I understand uh, the result is already there, according to uh, the last speaker. Uh, okay, the decision seems to have been made that we should revisit the patent system to help pharmaceutical companies based in Europe. Kind of, uh, as you said, it's, 
it's a, that's a, it was a slip of the tongue maybe of, uh, of Bruno, but uh, as you said, it's, uh, at some level, it's, uh, it's a nice, uh, indeed, a nice present. Uh, and then the question I was asked was, how is it so obvious that uh, doing this is what we should do to help uh, European citizens? Now, I understand there could be some employment effect and things like that. Uh, or at least they can be threats by big pharma companies about future employment if you don't uh, behave. But somehow, I mean, reading a lot of the literature, it seems that a lot of patents are being granted. A lot of new products, new drugs are being approved that have marginal additional value, so-called Me Too drugs. I mean, it's everywhere, huh? these kind of things. Some of the prices are enormous. Uh, so... Uh, I mean, uh, the welfare state systems are being milked by ever-increasing drug prices. Uh, I mean, is this the thing? I mean, these pharmaceutical companies are phenomenally <laughs> profitable of the top 100 market caps uh, in, uh, of the world, in, based in the US and in Europe, 15 of them are pharma companies. Uh, a lot of their shareholders are not even Europeans, of course. Huh? They are uh, maybe BlackRock and things like that. Um, so are we doing the right thing? Shouldn't we, for example, instead thinking, okay, we put a lot of money, maybe not enough, I would agree to that, uh, put a lot of money in our universities to fund research, maybe we can lever that, leverage that, and, for example, help universities uh, get the returns of their innovation, and universities, uh, if they get public money, like ERC grants, they have to be in Europe. And so, or is this naive? So that was a bit the, my provocative question. It's indeed a quite big question in this regard. Yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, Christine. Oh, oh sorry, did you no, not? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Christine Fears from FPA. Um, thank you for, for having this really important debate. I, I think it's, we hear so many things today it's, it, from different angles, really interesting. Um, it just shows how, how important the, the topic is. Um, the title, Revisit, surprised me a little bit, and because I, I heard, like you did, well, are we already there? Have we already made a decision? But what I heard from the first speaker, for Amarilis, you mentioned, this is about a review, this is an analysis, uh, and there's, there's still a lot of, of studies that are being debated, that are being looked into, uh, that are still ongoing. Uh, before we can actually evaluate and decide what needs to be done. Um, I'm also very conscious when I hear all the, the interventions, it's not just about IP. It's a lot about access as well. Um, and we're combining all of that. So th this is becoming very complex, complicated. Um, and I, I think we need to be very careful. Somebody mentioned as well, let's, let's make sure that we see, that we understand what the, the impact is of if we take a decision, if we, have a, 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 we take a political uh, direction and, uh, and, and, and take measures, if we do revisit, let's make sure that we know how it helps and, or what the impact is on every different angle of the, 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 the whole ecosystem for patients, for industry, for innovation, for, for everything. Um, and I don't think we're there yet. I, I think it needs to be really looked at very carefully. Um, and I know that the Commission is, is making that effort. So let's not jump to conclusions and make sure that, that we look at everything. So my, my plea is, I hear that, that um, from the studies that we have now, it is shown the, what, what the the, um, the value is of, of the incentives, and maybe we don't, you know there might be other things as well. But but I, I hear at least that we think this this is doing good work. So how can we make sure that we at least not throw that away and erode on on innovation, erode a system that works, uh, and then make sure that we also solve the other problems? But maybe that's not IP is not the way to go. Uh, but look look at it in a broader way. Then thank you. I want to still collect some questions because I think we will not have time for a second round. So if you really want to ask a question, do it now. <laughs> Be short. Yep. Hi, th hi, thank you. My name is Carmen Pan. I'm a healthcare reporter with Politico. Um, I have a question for a Christian and a question for Mrs. Kyle. Um, Christian, in your report, I felt that uh, one of the main 
questions that were addressed by the Health Council in 2016 was whether the IP incentives for pharmaceuticals in Europe contribute to those really high um, launching prices for medicines. Um, and I, from, from reading, and I, I admit not the whole report, I felt it wasn't you know, a clear response to that question. So I, wa I was wondering if you want to say, on, you know, if you want to clarify that for me. And Mrs. Carl, you were, you were mentioning the, the whole issue of IP and, and obviously the, you know, hinting to what the U.S. administration has said. So do you, do you agree that indeed, for example, the U.S. is actually paying more for innovation and, and Europe is, is, um, is free riding on that? I didn't really quite get where you were on that. Thank you. Yep, that's a big question. Is this, there was one more question? No. No? Okay. So then I think uh, we go back to the to the panel here. Um, maybe I can start with Bruno. There were quite a lot of questions um, which addressed more broadly uh, pattern protection. Is that really the the best uh, system um, to uh, to motivate and incentivize innovation here? Um, are there other instruments that would actually be better than, than patenting and more effective in order to bring innovation to market uh, here? I guess, Bruno, that's a question for you to address. Yes, just to, to summarize what I said and confirm, it's not only related to the patent system, definitely, but the patent system plays an important role. It's an ecosystem. Uh, I really, I mean, I know that I talked about the broad patent system and the unitary, but we, we can't fix a component of a system is a broad system, it's not perfect. I mean, you can simplify the patent at a national patent office and get 20 years of protection, <laughs> which, uh, I mean, yes, but, at the moment. But the and, question was actually, could we also use other instruments, like, for instance, grants, of, subsidies? Of course, of course. I think I was, uh, well, I, I didn't have time, but uh, the, the European instrument ERC is fantastic. But we should help, and I know that there is a small uh, subsidy from ERC to file patent and, and, uh, and make uh, prototyping and so on. But what universities need to have is complementary resources and freedom uh, to manage the knowledge transfer and to make sure that they have uh, a return from, from what they do. Uh, that would be a fair equilibrium uh, between pharmaceutical companies and universities. In my university, all the litigation we have, and believe me, we don't like to go in litigation. We don't like at all. But those we did is because we were 120% sure of winning. We got 70% of what we wanted. Every time, non-European multinationals who really did not respect the deal. So it is very important to help universities doing that. Another systemic uh, factor is the quality of patent system. I believe the European Patent Office does a very a relatively good job with quality, the USPTO has three times more patent application than Europe. How come? It's because you have much more gaming, because in the US patent system, you check the quality of the patent system in the litigation, so it doesn't play its social role, whereas in Europe, uh, we have other problems, but uh, not that one. And we should be wary at what uh, China is doing. We saw 1 million 400 patent application per year and a grant rate of 75%. <laughs> So thank you. So you basically are still defending the quality, the, the patent system, as long as we can get the quality uh, right here. But of course, there's also the problem that yeah. it's it's an instrument that has to be uniform across all technologies uh, or whatever. And so the definitely, point Margaret, just one point, please. sorry. Uh, yeah. Where it should be located, it should be coordinating between EMEA and the European Commission, the competition policy, why not? <laughs> Uh, who is delivering this right is very important and it should be European Union and nothing else. Yeah. But then one other point that, that was raised was then what right are we actually delivering and does it really reflect also the cost of doing uh, innovation here and sufficiently can differentiate? There was a point that Margaret uh, perhaps was, um, could, could address best is to which extent does the patent system and SPS really reflect the cost of doing uh, innovation uh, here and does it allow for the right proper trade-off if we uh, need to have a, a common framework for all technologies and all countries and all? So I actually think we shouldn't pay that much attention to the cost of innovation because if it turned out that it cost very little to develop the cure for Alzheimer's, I think we should be really happy with that. 
uh, where I think we need to pay more attention, and many European governments are moving in this direction by using health technology uh, bodies, is to focus on what is the value. So this, this question of Me Too products or marginal value-added products uh, was, was referenced earlier. I think that is a big issue, both in Europe and in the US. Arguably, it's better in Europe. I would argue it's slightly better in Europe than in the US. Uh, that the system does a better job trying to provide information about the relative benefits and direct patients towards those that have the greatest efficacy or the greatest cost effectiveness. But we could do much, much more on that. And I think having clear, uh, transparent criteria that governments commit to, so sometimes it's painful to pay a lot for a breakthrough product that does its that does everything it promises, but we have to suck it up and pay for it when it actually happens, and we have to not pay when it's not working or when it's not adding very much. Uh, and so basically more efficient use of healthcare resources. Um, so uh, to come back to the, to, to the question from, uh, from MSF about essentially should we do something more like cost plus, I'm not a huge fan of cost plus precisely for that reason. I think if it costs nothing to develop a breakthrough product, we should be happy with that and not, I guess my big concern with cost plus kinds of approaches is that I don't think we should be guaranteeing a rate of return on crappy products, on, on products that don't add very much. And that would be my worry, that it would be too easy for, for industry to game what the, the costs are, and we would end up being on the hook for each drug saying, you know, you, we have to give you a 12% return or something like that. And, and I, would rather, I would rather focus just on the benefits that, that we're actually getting. And for the, the very difficult question as to whether the EU is, in fact, freeing, free riding on the US, uh, I hope not, because I don't think the U.S. system is the one that we should be uh, copying. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there are a lot of inefficiencies in the U.S. system that we don't necessarily want to have affect the European allocation of resources either. It's difficult to say because the U.S. pays more for almost every aspect of healthcare. So the fact that the U.S. pays more also for pharmaceuticals does not necessarily, and, and so Europe pays relatively less. We also pay less for doctors. We also pay less for <laughs> hospitals. There's all sorts of other things we pay less for. Um, I will say that I, th I think there are clear incentives uh, to, to free ride on other countries, and I think where Europe could do more is investing more in scientific research. So I would you know, do put much more money in the ERC because it's, it's nowhere close to what the NIH is spending, just as an example. Thank you, very welcome. <laughs> so, but this is indeed a big uh, other question. Maybe we will organize an event on, on, on that uh, later on. Uh, I know also some issues were addressed to you, to, to the sector uh, here. Uh, particularly, for instance, to which extent is, is really the patent protection and the strength of it? Um, is that an issue for locating R&D and keeping uh, uh, R&D activities here in Europe? Uh, or not? What keeps you in your... Yeah, no, no. I think this is, has no impact, and we can also take this from, from the studies that uh, uh, the, the, the IP system also has not, not much impact on, on the selection of the places where you do your, your research. And then we can, of course, go back to uh, your comment, uh, there should be more financial support or support for universities. There, I think, uh, where you said, uh, Margaret, the, the healthcare system in Europe is much better than in, in the US, or is a, has a lot of advantages, I would say. But with regard to the collaboration between industry, pharmaceutical industry, uh, 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 there's a huge difference. This works much better in the US, and so the universities get their, their return. And I think there is something that can be done. And we had also on the German level discussions with German-based universities. But it's, there's still a gap in, in having a fruitful exchange. It's much easier with, with uh, US partners, I have to say, than with sometimes with, with European universities and uh, finally I want to underline what uh, what Christine said that uh, we have now a situation where the, the export waiver is proposed and it was taken out of the incentive discussion and we have to be very careful that we do not start and end up in a situation where we turn a screw here a screw there doing something here and where nothing is really coordinated it has to be uh, really uh, a compact, complex consideration, and we have to be very clear on the impact and on the signals uh, these changes, if any, uh, uh, what, they, what they send out. And it's also, as I said in the beginning of my, my short statement, it's also important uh, 
to look then and then into both study reports because they have really good elements and uh, give good recommendations either directly or between the lines uh, that our system is, 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 is a good one and that it's worthwhile to keep the status quo in, in many uh, aspects here. Thank you. Christian, there were some very specific questions also yes, addressed um, to you. Just very briefly, um, maybe just just building a little bit on what Professor Kyle said. I think the sort of cost plus model is um, maybe take it from a different uh, example because the point is you you sort of get to that kind of discussion once you see very you know individual products that are extremely profitable. Um, I think everyone feels that you know, shouldn't couldn't we do that in another and re and reward that kind of effort in another way. Um, I think uh, as an economist looking at that, there's, there's a big, big difference between how an investment decision looks ex ante before you start it, and that's really what you want to affect with incentives and how then things play out in the end. Some things turn out to be really profitable, some things turn out not to be very profitable. Um, so I think that, that kind of idea makes it sometimes difficult to conclude based on what happened and then take that back and use that as a template for how to model incentives in the first place. So not really an answer whether one should do that or not. I'm just saying as an economist, there's a big difference between ex post what happened and, and ex ante, you know, what did the decision look like and what was the framework when we stood and looked into decisions on, on investment. Um, the link between protection, uh, the effective protection length, and, and the R&D is, is carried out through sort of the data work that we did. So it's very data-driven, um, using uh, the database with the 558 products uh, along a number of different countries and linking uh, protection to, to R&D efforts. So it's really uh, a statistical analysis that, that is sort of showing uh, quite stable, I would say, across a number of different model specifications that we did uh, coming up with that um, result. Uh, finally, I had a very specific question from Carmen from Politico on the IP effect on high prices. I think what we're trying to, what we're showing is that uh, exactly this kind of dynamic versus the static. So you have an incentive working in a dynamic sense, but of course, you know, that's, uh, you don't uh, need an economist to say that. But basically, if you add years in the end that you could have not added, and you expect generic entry to come in at a lower price faster, then that's kind of the loss you could you could talk about in a static sense. I would say in that sense, I, I, I think the I'm maybe a little bit looking a little bit about the me too or marginal added products that Professor Kyle talked about in the sense that they they do sort of add all things they equal to innovator and innovator competition. And I think you know, uh, it might not be that, that companies only are copying what, what's out there intentionally. If you see a great market potential 10, 15 years before, might more than one company try to reap that market, and, and then it turns out that they get on the market sort of within the same uh, couple of years, and they might just not, you know, be that different. Uh, so, so, of course, you don't, you don't really add to the clinical effect, uh, but, but again, the incentives played, and it played out like that. And of course, what's interesting, if it, if it has an impact on, on innovation, have, on, on prices, having more innovative products, in, and you don't have to wait, so to speak, for the, uh, for the generics to enter. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to give the floor to Roberto so that I can leave the last floor to Amarilis. <laughs> yeah, so Roberto, do you still have some comments? There were not that many issues addressed personally to you, but you have still some views. To some consideration of uh, uh, Professor van Poltersberg, uh, the issue of the granting, uh, sorry for my pronunciation, I, hope oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I know your contribution anyway to the European Patent Office, Patent System, um, only two remarks. Uh, first, it's completely accurate uh, that the European Patent Office operates under the European Patent Convention uh, is an independent agency, is not under the control of the European Commission from uh, the point of view of multilateral agreements. But the Patent Office does not operate fully independently from policy choice made by ULO makers. I make three examples. Directing by technological invention, 
it was implemented in the PC, the interpretation adopted by the Court of Justice is followed strictly by the Patent Office. Second point, even a notice of the European Commission explaining how the European Commission understands Article 4 of the Biotechnological Directive is followed by the examiner of the Patent Office. And the Article 33, APC 2000, the member state can implement through a the simple, simple the administrative council without revision of the treaty can amend the APC to implement union law. So I think uh, there are a number of options for the European Commission to provide rules that can operate under the European Patent Convention. But when the rules are adopted, and that's a policy choice, the European Patent Office should not adopt any policy choice. It's a question of granting patent rights under the rule of law. So um, also in the United States, the agency is in the, of course, when you enact the guidelines for examination, you have a broad leeway, but there is a option for the EU lawmakers and for the Commission to influence the agency. As the issue who should grant the, the, the SPC was one of the topics analyzed by the study of the Max Planck from a legal perspective. The reaction of the stakeholders, they want to have experience examine of the National Patent Office, a virtual office that was the prevailing reaction, and the institutional roof of an agency. If this agency is an EU agency, the second instance for appeal against the decision rejecting the application for the certificate of unitary effect must be, for primary law reasons, the general court. The favor of the applicants is to involve the UPC. In this way, it would be possible to consolidate revocation action against granted certificate that are subject to the jurisdiction of the UPC and appeal against the decision rejecting the application. The same, that's the favor of the stakeholders. I can understand the reason for this favor because at national level, usually the same court is competent for both. So I want only to report this uh, information that we collected with our study. And, but I agree with your analysis. I want only to point out that there are view to influence the European Patent Office. The only way to involve the OPC in the appeal uh, is uh, to establish a virtual SPC unitary division under the institutional roof of the European Patent Office. In that case, it will be possible, under the perspective of union law, to entrust the UPC by amending Article 32 of the UPC agreement with appeal. Thank you very much for this uh, clarification. I think it was really good uh, clarification. So, Amarilis, okay. last word is for you. Um, yes, thank you very much. I will be brief. Well, thanks, um, thanks all for the discussion today. Because, as I mentioned before, um, we have just recently tabled one proposal, and yes, to the question whether we are satisfied with the proposal, I can, I can immediately answer, yes, we were satisfied with the proposal that we have tabled, of course, otherwise we wouldn't have tabled it. But uh, the real proof of the padding is whether the Council and the Parliament will be satisfied now with the proposal, because that, that's where the proposal lies. Now, we believe, of course, from our perspective, that it's fit for purpose, that it will also uh, achieve the objective that we hope it will achieve, uh, better competitiveness in Europe for all pharmaceutical industries going forward to the future. So let's see what Parliament and Council now thinks about that. But again, that proposal is just one issue uh, that we, for which we saw an urgent need uh, to intervene and for which we also felt that our evidence base was ready. Uh, but there are still other issues that are ongoing. Um, the, the, the whole review of the pharmaceutical incentives as asked for by the Health Council is not yet completed. There are still studies ongoing. And yes, that is a very wide picture. A lot of elements come into the equation, so that, will, that is still keeping us busy. But also the evaluation of the SPC proposal, uh, of the SPC regime as such, is also still open. We, are, we haven't closed that. So, well, um, some work now and lots of work in the future. And we're very happy for the discussion, for feeding into it. Thank you. Uh, excellent way to conclude. Still work to be done in, in future uh, here. So I think the discussion really made clear that uh, if we discuss SPS, 
that should really be in much broader context uh, here. So should we really talking about the whole policy mix and also the more global context should be taken uh, into account. And I think that means that here at Bruegel, we should have this, um, keep on following this discussion and keep on uh, uh, organizing events uh, in this respect. So keep an eye on, on our next activities. I, always forgot to say, but the two studies that we have been discussing, they will be, um, so the link to that will be available on, on our website uh, here. So, rest me just to thank uh, the participants of the discussion today here. I think uh, it was really a great panel discussion that we have here, so uh, let me thank you all for doing this. And have a nice summer, but uh, after the summer, 